across the globe and are occurring with increasing frequency as humans increase in our movement around, around the planet and inadvertently introduce invasive species. And there are examples of this all over the world, but just a few maybe well-known examples from North America are um, plague in prairie dogs, sudden oak death, white nose syndrome, and West Nile virus. And these introduced pathogens exert really strong selection on our hosts, which are naive and have had no co-evolutionary co relationship. And so the, the, today I'll be telling you about uh, avian malaria in Hawaii. And so avian malaria was introduced. It's the introduced pathogen that I'm focusing on. We all know that Hawaii is a really isolated archipelago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 4,000 kilometers from the nearest continent. And as a result of its isolation, it has a lot of really classical examples of adaptive radiation, including the famous Hawaiian honey creepers shown here. Unfortunately, in the late 1930s, uh, humans accidentally introduced Plasmodium relictum, which is the strain, the only strain of uh, Plasmodium that is on Hawaii today. And they all, we also introduced Culex hincapastiatus, this mosquito vector. That, and these are, um, although there's a large diversity that we just heard about in avian malaria, as well as mosquito vectors, these are the only two um, important players on Hawaii. Just since the time avian malaria was introduced, at least six of the 55 honey creeper species have gone extinct. And so this is in a really short, incredibly short time frame. And of the resulting remaining species, all of them have uh, gone locally extinct at low elevations down here where the mosquitoes can persist. And so the only place you now find native honey creepers is in this really narrow zone uh, where there are still trees. It's not where it's not above tree line, but where it's high enough that there are no mosquitoes. And so of course one of our major concerns is with climate change, as the as the climate warms, mosquitoes are going to be able to expand their, their elevational range, and um, essentially there will be no more disease-free refugia for Hawaiian honey creepers. And we've actually already started to see this pattern where mosquitoes are moving up in elevation. So one of our questions is, are we gonna lose this spectacular diversity of honey creepers, or is there any reason to, for us to believe that there might be um, a possibility for adaptation to malaria? So today I'll tell you the story of the Hawaii amakihi, which is one of one species of honey creeper here that lives on the island of Hawaii and has evolved tolerance to malaria. And by tolerance, I just mean they become highly infected with plasmodium. We can catch them with really high parasitemia and they, they live their entire lives with this chronic infection uh, with no known fitness consequences. And this is really incredible because it's been only about 30 Amakihi generations since the introduction of malaria. And so we really wanna understand how that's happening. And there's a, a million interesting questions that um, we can that we can ask, and but kind of the basis for all those questions, we have to first understand what the genetic architecture of these changes are. So what are what is the genomic underpinning of tolerance to avian malaria? And we take a really uh, multi-pronged approach to answering this question. So we primarily use genomics and transcriptomics, but we tackle the question from um, multiple spatial, temporal, and um, experimental scales. Today I will just be talking about genomics at the spatial scale of within the island of Hawaii. And so we've sampled from 14 populations across the island of Hawaii along elevational gradients. And for this talk, I'm actually going to be ignoring this kind of, this is a low, mid, and high elevation. I'll be ignoring the mid elevation and just be comparing low elevation with high elevation birds. And the way that I define elevation, low and high elevation, is are mosquitoes present? So um, low elevations have mosquitoes present and the birds have evolved in the presence of plasmodium, whereas at high elevations there are no mosquitoes and there's no malaria. Um, we have, I, said, I think I said 14 populations, so this is 19, 96 birds. Um, and the approach is we'll be looking for genes that are important to cross scale, so spatial, temporal, and experimental. But then of course we can break down the uh, spatial scale into multiple different analyses. And we're really looking for genes that right here are important in all of the different, uh, all of our comparisons. Uh, and I think I'll just say now that experimental challenges are uh, really important from the perspective of, we have these 
high elevation and low elevation birds, but we also expect them to be genetically differentiated just because of the fact that they're geographically separate. And in fact, Amakihis only disperse about 500 meters up and down in elevation. And so in order to get at the genes that are really important for malaria and not just other things associated with elevation like temperature and oxygen, it's really important to do some experimental challenge work. So the genomic approach that we're using is uh, largely based on a lot of work by this graduate student, Taylor Calicrate, who's finishing up at the University of Maryland right now. And she, did, she developed a genome for the Hawaii Yamakihi. And then from this genome, she uh, designed a capture array with 40,000 SNPs distributed randomly across the genome. And the reason that we use this approach <coughs> is because we've tried a lot with candidate genes in the past, um, major things that you might think of being important to disease resistance, like major histocompatibility complex. And none of those have really produced any sort of uh, concrete patterns as to why on a key might be evolving tolerance. So this is just a, a plot of heterozygosity across the genome from chromosome 1 to 28 in the Z chromosome. And so you can see that there's you know, pretty relatively consistent heterozygosity, except for in these really a uh, couple of areas right here that are really interesting and show absolutely no diversity. And so we were interested in examining these regions as potential sources of selective sweeps. And so we um, took the sequences around these regions and used the, uh, a genome browser for the zebra finch to try to figure out what genes are in this region. And uh, we looked kind of right in that region as well as stepwise uh, further out. And it turns out that actually all the genes in that area are things that are important in the cell cycle. And so these are all of the genes are really conserved across all taxa, um, from vertebrates to plants to even archaea. And so these are probably not genes that are actually important in malaria resistance, top uh, but they are important in, they are, they are of course under directional selection, but we're gonna ignore those for now. And so I've put them in the, the part of the Venn diagram that's outside of the importance in malaria. So the next approach is to uh, look for FSP outliers between the um, low and high elevations to see if there are loci that are especially uh, differentiated between the two. And um, so normally when you see this kind of plot, you have like a line up here that is kind of your threshold and any loci that are more differentiated than that line are significant. And the reason that they don't have a line is because it's way up out of the picture. There are no significant statistical outliers and the main reason I think for that is that I pooled all low and all high elevation individuals. And you can see here that they're taken from all across the island and they're probably not demographically independent. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm breaking this and repeating this analysis on a population pair scale. And so I'm through about half of the population pairs and I'm just gonna be looking for outliers that are important between high and low population pairs. And Unfortunately, there are also no statistical outliers there. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, so, um, and I think the reason for that is because now when I, when I broke it down by population, I lost a lot of uh, individuals that were, you know, one or two individuals per population, which is not really enough for me to feel confident calling the population. And even some of the ones that remained had only four individuals from a certain locality. So I think if this is just a loss of statistical power. Um, and so what I have done so far is in, three population pairs that I've analyzed. I just took these loci that the arrows are pointing to that are, there were, I picked from two to five loci per population pair that were the most differentiated. And then I, I um, looked for loci that were important in multiple population pairs. And there have turned out to be three of these so far. And when you blast, well, what happens to me a lot is I, I get excited and I find a locus of interest and then I blast it and it says, it blasts to some unknown gene. Uh, but one out of the three did blast to this um, abeta defensin gene, which is a gene that codes for antimicrobial peptides. And so that is uh, one potential candidate so far that might be important in um, malaria tolerance in these birds. So the, I'm gonna tell you briefly about uh, a really preliminary experimental challenge that was done about 15 years ago. And this resulted in uh, two survivors and four mortalities in this data set, so it's a small data set, but 
Um, and then and I did a genome-wide association study to look for loci that were strongly associated with survivorship outcome. And in this, there actually turned out to be quite a few statistical uh, loci that were statistically associated with survivorship. And so I just took the, the 40 most strongly associated loci and blasted them. And I still need to do a real gene ontology analysis. This is just um, how I categorized some of the genes that turned up. And so some of them we can see inflammatory response is something that we might expect to play a role in tolerance to disease. But others I'm really baffled by. So if anybody has ideas about why olfaction might be important in adapting to malaria, I would love to hear ideas on that. And so one of the inflammatory response genes that turned out to be important in this challenge experiment was actually the same beta defense gene that we saw earlier. So that's uh, kind of our strongest potential candidate right now, although I will, um, I want to acknowledge that this is very much a work in progress. I still have to analyze multiple other population pairs. And one of the interesting things that we can do with, uh, there's one transect we have here that we have infection data for, and so we can use the, the genome-wide association approach to look um, for loci that are associated with actual infection in the wild. Another thing we're really excited about is comparing um, the genomes of Amakihi before and after the introduction of avian malaria. And so this is a, a plot of SNPs across the genome in a different honey creeper, the Kauai creeper. And this just demonstrates that our capture approach works really well uh, for avian specimens. And then finally, we're about to start in a couple of weeks um, a more a broader experimental challenge experiment where we'll be comparing not only the genomes of birds that survive and die, but we're also going to be monitoring the gene expression between the two groups as well as over the course of the infection. So we're excited about that. So I'll just return to this first question that I posed and I'll say that uh, so what we found in the Hawaii Anakihi is that in only 30 generations, this uh, species has been able to evolve to adapt to this really virulent pathogen. And given that uh, these species all radiated from a single ancestor, they likely share a lot of the same genetic diversity. And so it may be that we just have to wait a little longer for some of these other species, hopefully not too long. Uh, so I have to thank a lot of my funding sources and thank you for all sticking around the last afternoon of the conference. I don't know if I have time for questions. Yes. Thank you.